So I'd like to begin by introducing our speaker. Tessa McWatt is a lecturer in creative writing at the University of East Anglia and the author of five novels, a novella for young readers, an opera libretto, and most recently a memoir, a memoir Shame on Me, An Anatomy of Race and Belonging. And she's also the director of City Life, a community project to combat loneliness and to mentor student writers. So as many of you know, Tessa was supposed to be launching her memoir in Canada last month. And so we were taking advantage of the fact that she was going to be back in Canada to invite her to speak to Hub Scholars about this community writing project because storytelling is at the heart of humanities research and teaching. So this Zoom call is our substitute for what we had hoped would have been a live event. My hope is that Tessa's talk and, and discussions of similar community writing projects might inspire some of you to consider um, developing some projects that the Public Humanities Hub can help you facilitate through assistance with grant applications, etc. So Tessa's going to talk for about 20 minutes, give or take. She has some slides, then we'll open the floor to your questions. Um, and I'll just turn it over to Tessa now. Thanks, Mary. Um, and thanks, everybody, for coming. I'm so disappointed that I didn't get to be in Vancouver, as you can imagine. Um, it's I'd much rather be there than in London at the moment from what I've heard in terms of how things are being handled there versus here. But really, um, it's my pleasure to speak to you about um, my project, my research project. And I'll just I'm going to share my screen because I have a um, PowerPoint um, uh, presentation, but it's please don't think of it as a presentation that you need to uh, bear up and sit through. In other words, interrupt me. I'd love to have a con I mostly want a conversation with you because this project is, um, is, is something that I completely um, love. I was saying to Mary before we started that, you know, when I retire or give up teaching or stop writing, this is the thing that I really want to do because it's really meaningful for me. And it's, um, and and it's connected and it and it has all kinds of rewards for everybody involved. So let me just get to my PowerPoint and I'll tell you about it. Does everybody see that? Yes. Um, and so it started out, um, you know, in terms of a, a way of thinking about it as as a civic engagement project, which our, my university at the time uh, was University of East London, and East London um, University of East London is uh, a very what has always been and very much is a community based university, um, <clears throat> unlike the University of London, for example, which is you know sort of international and spread around the city, um, East London serves its local community. And I think one of the things, in, in, and I don't know how you know, higher education is doing there in Canada at the moment, but here, you know, it's really important for um, uh, smaller universities to make a mark in their community and that's the way they maintain their their um, profile and their funding. So this was an important project at the time our vice chancellor was encouraging civic engagement projects and because I taught life writing at the time um, I uh, and I and I do life writing and I think about life writing as um, uh, cultural history um, and and not just creative writing I, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I thought it was an opportunity to use the initiative that was given to us through the University of East London to start a project. So, <clears throat> excuse me. And so I did. Um, and the, fir the first iteration of it was called East Life. And it was, again, in terms of um, how to, it, it, just getting it off the ground, it was meant as a community project with students and East London um, residents and East London elders in particular. And after that, um, th that project, and I'll tell you about how it started and what um, we 
did in it because it became a prototype for what we're doing now, which is um, larger. It's about city life, it's stories against loneliness, and it's um, in a, a few cities at the moment. It's in Brighton, it's in Norwich where I teach, and it's also in London, it's still at um, the University of East London. So it began with um, a 5,000 pound grant to, to, for me to hire a um, research assistant <clears throat> and someone who helped me organize the project because the project was about going into community centers with our students. And I'll get into the specifics of that in a moment. Um, but generally, the, the principles of it was that, you know, <clears throat> we, were, we were really interested in, in those um, voices, both student voices and uh, community voices that weren't being heard, that weren't being part of the conversation in mainstream um, media or even talked about amongst academics. It, it didn't seem to be um, something that, that, that kind of intergenerational, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> that kind of intergenerational um, participation wasn't something that was actively pursued. So we thought that we had to do that. And, um, and I have here creativity as connecting because I think the most important um, thing for me about this project is that it's not oral history. It's not um, just uh, journalism. And I say just journalism, not as a criticism of journalism, but what it really is, is that it's, uh, it's storytelling and it's uh, two people creating a story together, co-creating. And in that co-creation, there's something amazing that happens. <clears throat> and that's what the crux of it is for me. So, as I said, I also think of it as life writing as cultural history. I, in, I, in my life writing class, which was a third year, a final year um, module for creative writing students, um, you know, uh, they would, you know, they're 20 something years old, most of them. And, um, and they just said, well, I don't have anything to write about. I, I can't write my story. I don't have a story. I have nothing. I'm not, you know, I'm, I haven't had a life yet. And I was so, um, challenged by that in terms of trying to tell them that that they were part of history and that they needed to um, tell their stories, to look at different ways of telling their stories and to look at, at ways of presenting their life as performance in a way. In other words, having a voice that they about themselves that they perform, which is what the creative part of this is and which creative writing does. Um, it's also about intimacy in that, um, that it's, the two, the elder and the student, being in the room at the same time sharing stories. And so that's an important part. It's not done over, I mean, I don't know how we're going to do it, given that there's social distancing going on, but um, uh, it, it's, it's about them in the same room, which is really important because a lot of the um, students that we've had in our first uh, iteration of this, you know, didn't, didn't know their grandparents, didn't have elders in their lives, you know, this was a, an important thing for them to be doing. They were scared of doing it, but they, this was an important thing. Um, the other issue I have here is access, um, meaning that we had to seek out the stories of these elders in the community. Um, they're not people, these were, these, you know, we're, I'm talking about a particular area of London, a working class area of London. They're not people who are sought out for their stories in, in any way, really. And, and often they're isolated in terms of um, access to technology, access to others, and just generally participation in cultural exchange and in art. Um, so that, those were the key things that we were looking at um, before we started. Um, lost my mouse, I don't, okay. So as I said, it started out in a um, creative writing, uh, life writing module. And each year we'd have a BA, MA um, students writing short pieces about a particular aspect of their lives. So one of the things that um, we talk about in life writing is that, you know, it's not about writing your whole autobiography. It's about choosing, it's about framing your life, performing a part of yourself that you want to um, give to an audience. So each of those, uh, they did that as final pieces, as pieces for assessment, for marking. And, and each of those pieces and those students, um, you know, were handed in and that was part of the, of the module. So that's part of their course that they had to do. 
And then out of that, and so each piece is a, you know, we had what, what we stress in the life writing class is that life writing and that performance means that it's not, that it's not static. It's about representation and it's about, it could be poetry. It could be mixed media hybrid. It could be, you know, um, we're playing around with point of view for, for the self, you know, what is the self? How do you represent that self? And what are you, the story that you're trying to tell? And we asked them to think about um, their parts of their life that were, that were important to them. So we'd give them um, themes about family, around race, gender, around um, memory, there are all kinds of uh, exercises throughout the module that they end up with a piece. And there are usually some amazing pieces. There are some of the most interesting creative writing pieces that I've read in my career as a teaching creative writing. So that was the other thing that I thought, you know, that, that once you let them, they're, they're frightened at the beginning and once you let them into this idea that they're performing the self um, and that, you know, what truth is and what memory is and what fact is, you know, they, they, have, they play with it beautifully. And you can see some of those pieces on the website, which I'll show you in a minute as well. So they ha we have these pieces and then as part of the, our um, East Life project, as part of the civic engagement that was mandated by the university, we asked students to volunteer and we described it the way I'm describing it to you in terms of, you know, cultural history, how important it is to hear unheard voices, how important it is to have intergenerational exchange. And, and we were um, flooded with students who are interested in doing extra writing and partly um, they were doing it for, for the experience and it was something to you know take forward after their third year but also we um, guaranteed them or we offered them or promised them uh, publication on our website so it's something that they have as their own uh, it, to be part of this project their autobiographical piece and their biographical piece are on the website so um, in the first year, we um, were, we had a very, it was very small. We had um, elders um, at, at the Canning Town Library coffee morning, we, and we had um, Age UK stroke survivors um, meetings. And so what we did was we, um, after the students um, handed in their work and we did, and we had to, um, coach them or train them in ethics in terms of you know what what how to ask questions to strangers and how to you know you know not to push all the kinds of things that we have in our we have to had to do a big ethical um uh, approval through the university and um but we went to the coffee morning for example and so we went and had so say 10 of us went and had coffee talked to the elders and just had in the first instance just had conversations and then usually what happened would there be a conversation that strike that's um striped up be between um two people a student and a and a um, member of the coffee morning and and then we would sort of keep touch of everybody and then ask them in the next time if they would be part of the project so it'd be about sort of breaking the ice with them at the beginning and then asking them to be involved um, and so out of that first um, uh, first time, we had um, an, we started an amazing um, sort of website with, and then we ended up getting, I think there are 25 stories that are published in an anthology. And so, um, and out of that, um, we, after that, we had a, um, a ceremony at the end of, of the, period and we um, read from the book and we invited all the elders to this um, uh, uh, a, a, a kind of a theater where we where we had the the ceremony and we had readings from the students and none of the elders wanted to read their work but the the students read pieces and it was just a really wonderful warm night to <clears throat> celebrate what we had come out of um, what had come out of this but I think that the most important thing that I want to share with you is um, part of the process that was the most interesting for me was um, 
so the students speak to the elders and they get the story and they and they get an idea of what the important thing is in this story so they get an idea of what's making it the the the, the storyteller come alive about it and then they take all their writing skills and their creative writing skills and their and their understanding of what um uh right life writing is and they go home and they write the story in some cases they kind of write a a verbatim or an oral history um, kind of uh, uh, tale in the first person as the writer herself or his, himself. And in other cases, it's in the third person, but in, it's always an interpretation and it's always a creative interpretation rather than straight um, uh, oral history, as I say. Um, and what was the best moment so that after, so after they've done this, before anything goes up or before any, we release any of these, they have to get the um, permission of the storyteller, obviously, to have these go up on the website. So we have a session where they read their pieces about the elder to these elders. And that's the moment of magic. That's the moment of change. That's the moment that is so special because you know you have people who are being heard for the first time. Their story is being heard. Their story, they, they've been seen uh, for a, moment in their life that they thought no one would ever uh, really take in or understand. And they're amazed by the creative power of the creative writing. And so we haven't had anybody reject the story yet. You know, they usually laugh and, and you know, cry and are totally moved by the fact that they have been represented by, in a story by a young person. <clears throat> So that's the key, and we did that in second year with um, people who, uh, parents who were in a hospice for, for the children with life-limiting conditions, and that was not a very big group, but it was a very profound um, group. And in the third year, I am, we have a PhD student um, who's working on this, and I'm going to show you some of her work, um, working on this, and she's brought a whole new range of London partners into um, the uh, mix of it. So it's something that we do a little bit of every year or have done. Um, and the public reading and the prize ceremony is um, we, on, on the top of this anthology and on top of the project, we decided that it would be a great thing to take into schools so that we offered a city life prize for life, for, for life writing to in, into um, high schools. And that became part of the project. That, slowly dwindled out because we had no money so we couldn't offer the prize after the first year but it was great the first year um okay let me go to so that's the cover of our anthology we we got it we had the money to a second round of money to publish it um we had it an, a professional editor and a copy editor and a, and a typesetter etc um and so yes yeah, so our outcomes is that we have autobiographies by the students, biographies written by the students, but about the community members. As I said, cultural exchange and intergeneral and generational exchange. And I'm going to show you the website um, in a second. Um, but the other things that we have, you know, the, the book, the um, what I have here is change. And, and why I say change is that the change was both ways. The change was on the part of the of the of the storytellers who had their stories written for them and certainly on the part of the um students who came back we have those who've graduated who had graduated and who are still working for city life because they love it so much so it's a really um engaging thing that let me just see if i can go to the website does that work yeah so there is our website. All of the um, stories are up. Um, let's see. East Life Stories. So these are the stories by the elders. Um, and then there are stories by the students. And so in each year, we sort of build on it. And we have, um, let's see. Just want to show you some of the encounters with. Um, oh, I don't know why those are all on their side. <laughs> uh, have to talk to Sam about that. 
Um, but so here's an, um, a photo of the book when it came out. We went to the library and and gave everybody that had participated in it um, a copy of the book. So that was very exciting. And this is in the um, Age UK group as well. So um, some more photos of us working together. And it's really, it's, it's, some of it is quite casual. Sometimes um, it's, it's just about having conversations. The conversations don't necessarily go anywhere, but you know, then we find another way to ask about stories. And so we just pursue it. And one of the things that I'm going to tell you about that we're going to do for um, in the next little while is that um, we, I want to, we want to go back to the same, um, elders that we've been talking to because there's this, there's this kind of funny thing about you know going in getting your research doing your thing and then leaving these people you know and, and not ever seeing them again so one of the things that we're really going to embed in this program is to keep these um, community members as part of our group so that we build on it um, okay so I'm, I'm not I'm going to go through this very quickly it's um, a, the, my a PhD student who's um, taken up, who's got a Stuart Hall Foundation scholarship to, to work as part of City Life and taken up the, the um, project and is working specifically on London identities. So I'm just going to go through, these are some of her slides, Erica Maserano, and she, she's doing, she's trying to understand London um, as a place in, 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 the, uh, um, in identity in terms of life writing. So, um, sorry. I lost my mouse again. Um, what relationship between place and identity merges from life writing by Londoners is one of her research questions. Um, and this is this is interesting because she's had to explain in to, to others in the discipline of narrative research, for example, and in her own trying to get grant money that this research isn't, but borrows from oral history, participatory action research and narrative research. Um, but it is life writing and cultural studies, but it does borrow from those other things. So it's a really, it's a kind of hybrid of, of research and, and community action, because we, one of the things that she's doing is that she's taking her, um, interviews from this project and writing an article, a cultural studies article. So here are just some of the storytellers that she's been working with and that the whole project has worked with in the last couple of years. Um, they might not be familiar to most of you, but they're, they're small um, neighborhood associations where you know, they're, they're supporting their local community. And so we've made contact with all of these people and have, you know, asked them when we can come in and bring our students and, and um, have them talk to their community. Um, and this is an interesting question that Erica is answer, asking in her project. You know, how do we engage with people from marginalized communities? Because, and, and her answer is reflexively, because um, would we define ourselves as marginalized? Um, and on what does that and on what criteria is is that based if 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 we're thinking about marginalized so it's a very important thing to think about how do we produce ourselves as writers um, of marginalized stories without being taken as marginalized necessarily so it's this kind of double double way of thinking about identity and i think that's a very important thing that she's doing and these are some other others of her questions in terms of identity belonging in the spatial um, geographies of belonging. I'm not going to spend very much time because I realize I'm going too slowly. Um, and more of her questions, the local and authenticity. So the, I think it's an interesting thing that she's talking about here is that, you know, with global, uh, we, we think we associate the global with, you know, culture and, and, um, and space and capital and, and then the, the local is something that um, is, we associate with authenticity, um, but you know what does what what's the what are the contradictions there? How does that work? Where do where does any given subject of an interview fit within that? 
Okay, so this is what's happening it, at the moment, what's, what's um, going to be happening in the future. Um, so in 2021, there's going to be a core module at um, the University of East Anglia in creative writing. Um, and so that, that this, pro this project is going to be embedded in a degree program so that every student who takes it will be doing this kind of thing. It might not be the same kind of um, uh, community member it might be a range of community members it might not necessarily be all elders it but but you know I'm, I'm designing it so that it's a matter of students having to engage in a community project um, the Erica's PhD is going to be completed next year um, we've got um, funding grants we've um, in with a few places um, and we're working with someone at um, Queen Mary University and at um, Barbara Taylor who is at Queen Mary is has done a history of solitude and she's um, got a welcome grant for a massive amount of money to study solitude and it's becoming much more important in this moment of isolation um, that to, in terms of what's what's solitude what's loneliness what's the history of of, of um, solitude and it's a really important project and we are trying to be part of the public engagement part of that project um, and then just tomorrow is my um, a deadline for a British Academy bid that is um, a response to COVID-19. Um, so it's one of these that we're going to go back into the um, communities that we've been to, to see how those people are doing, you know, in, in terms of lockdown. Some of them might not be there. Some of them, you know, they'll have a various... Um, a range of stories uh, to share. I think if they will, if they feel okay doing that, we're going to do it all. Obviously, all um, remotely, over the phone. So it's going to be quite different. That intimacy that we talked about isn't going to necessarily be, be there, but um, it certainly will be um, people that the, the students already know. So um, it should be. It should be okay. Um, and I think that was it for my presentation and for me talking <coughs> I've taken up <laughs> Great. a lot of that's that's wonderful that gives us a lot to think about so um, now we're just wondering if people want to ask questions in the chat or Heather you could unmute the voices so that people can um, be speak and ask a question or people can use the raise your hand function. So I think I noticed that Ria has her hand up. So do we, can we start with Ria? Just, I just want to make sure you're unmuted. Hi Ria. Hi Tessa. We, we meet, well, we meet almost in person. <laughs> yeah, I know. Nice to see you. You too, you too. Um, I loved your presentation and I love the whole project. Um, I've done some similar projects myself and one question that I wanted to ask you, uh, from what you said, it sounds like you have very clear strategies when the students are doing their own life writing for releasing them from sort of ossified presentations of their lives. Mm -hmm. It made perfect sense to me. I think mm -hmm. that might be more of a challenge with the elders that you're working with, and I wanted to ask you about that specifically. Absolutely, absolutely. If you have a look at the um, the website, you'll see that the autobiographies are kind of out there and 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 creative and poetic, and that the and that the biographies are much more straightforward. And it's and and partly because the students, some of them don't want to change the story at all. You know, they feel quite loyal to the to the and getting it right and to getting the facts right. And so the the, the way that <clears throat> the way that they work on it is that there's there's it's structured. In other words, it has a storyline, it has an arc, it has the beginning, middle middle and end, rather than um, it just being kind of um, the detail of the of the story. So um, it, you're absolutely right. And and some uh, one, two or three of the students have tried really adventurous things with um, the, the biograph biographies and they've gone down really well. So it's not that they don't want it, it's that you know the students I think are, are timid about the experimentation. One student who, at the, who did um, someone who was a stroke survivor who spoke 
quite with difficulty and spoke in a broken up way, she wrote a beautiful poem. She wrote a beautiful, you know, poem that that had broke, you know, had broken lines and stopped in in different ways. And so, representing his speech, and and so it does, it can work. Thank but that's you. a good point. Thank you. I see a question from Michael. I'm not sure if he's still here because I don't see him in the participant list anymore. So maybe I'll just read his question, Tessa. It's a little bit related. <clears throat> he says a documentary. Oh, Michael, do you want to ask your own question? I'll, I'll ask it. So he says a documentary film director uh, whose name he can't remember, said consent was not a contract, but a relationship, and it goes both ways. So with your current work and the progress of city life, uh, how can consent be redefined? That's really interesting because one of the um, questions that we've come, come up against is why don't the elders tell their own stories? You know, why is it the students who are, are, are writing those stories? And we are incorporating that in our, in our newer iterations. So the consent, it, I think it's about, um, I don't know about redefining consent, but it is about um, uh, going both ways. In other words, it is, like I said in the presentation, it is a, a, a relationship and an intimacy that happens between these students. And some of the students are still in touch with their partners and are, um, you know, check in with them regularly. So, um, but I do think that is, I do think it is an issue in terms of voice and who, um, and whose voice is speaking for that person. And the, the consent that we got and that we get and we have to do all kinds of consent forms. Um, but the consent that we got from the, the elders in the first few rounds were about their stories being written for them. And I think there's, um, there's more to be done with people writing their own stories, but it would be about facilitating them in a writing workshop that would say, you know, this is how maybe you'd, you'd put this into a narrative arc, or this is how you would, this is a way you would experiment with, with the eye or something like that. So, um, yeah, I don't know if I've answered your question, Michael. Uh, I don't see any other questions in the chat group or chat line, but um, I'm wondering if I just unmute everyone, if someone might wanna take the floor. Uh, Sarah. Um, I was just wondering, um, cause I, sorry, I don't know how to electronically raise my hand. Um, I was just wondering, uh, Tessa, if you could just talk a little bit more, um, about, um, you said you were incorporating into the next time that you do this, you're incorporating more of, um, the elders or whoever you're working with more of them doing, writing their own stories. Can you just say yeah. more about like, how are you doing that? And and will it maybe be more of a collaboration or something or yeah it will be it will be kind of co-creation really and it's and, and and even the the biographies the way they are now are kind of co-creation you know they share they get shared in in various um uh uh stages of the draft um but it really is currently the student who's driving the creative aspect of it and i think what we will do is make is tr is you know present strategies to because we have a workshop at the beginning with the writer all the writers is present strategies for those writers to enable the creativity to come out of the 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 partners you know the of the elders mm -hmm. so that they they can do a draft of it for example first some of them don't want to some of them yeah. have no desire to right. but some of them do want to so i think that that it will be an exchange that is about um uh creative writing workshopping mm -hmm. yeah so you're doing such interesting work i'm really oh, thank you yeah thanks it's, it is great i see a hand raised saying do you want to jump in yeah. Hi. Um, Tessa, thank you so much for the presentation. I think it's a, such a great idea for a project on many different levels and for so many different participants. Um, I guess my question is one of those. So I can see how 
in theory, all of this would work out perfectly. Um, <laughs> but I think part of the, uh, also like the, the most rewarding and the most interesting part of it is probably the, the lived experience of yeah. undergoing, you know, the encounters yeah. and the questions. And, but I can also see how sometimes, particularly when you're um, speaking to someone whose background may be very different from your own, um, people may have very different life world views, I guess I'm saying like you know, different life experiences and worldviews. So I'm wondering like whether, um, I guess I'm just asking if you can talk a little bit more about yeah. that. Not that you have to have any answer, but like what if, I'm just, for example, what if like a young Muslim woman went to interview someone uh, yeah. of a different generation who may have like different views yeah. about gender race things like that yeah. and it's not really you know our place to say like one worldview is wrong or you know that one Absolutely, should yeah. be corrected in some way so it's like how do you make space for the different voices it's, and the different ways yeah it's a big deal a big question we do we have a kind of ethics ethics training for the writers at the beginning and um and so and and so we you know, we talk about all of those things and we talk about you know the cultural um differences a cultural appropriation we talk about um you know the the, the fact that they might not get along with the the person that they're and they, they're really talking to or they might not agree with so it is a it is a bit of a teaching opportunity but also um with the elders I don't know. I I don't know if it's maybe it's just about the the people who would decide to be a part of that project. We've never had a problem. We've never had a clash with you know any of the participants, and so that could be just luck. But um, um, but it, everything at every meeting at the beginning when we go, the, the, my two research assistants and I go in to the community the, the for the example, the coffee morning together. So we we kind of making sure everything's okay, and we're and we talk to them and make sure that you know that they want to do they want to be there, and if they don't, we leave them alone. And you know, so it's it's delicate, and it, as you say, it's like on the ground um, sensitivity training, I think. Um, but it's also where I've noticed that that things have that people. This is the change issue, you know. They're the, the the young people who have talked to some of those East End um, L L Londoners um, have had no idea of the kinds of things that that they had been through, and and kind of understand the the the, the clashes of culture that go that goes on there, and and so it's. It's op you know, it's opening at for an opening for everybody all the time. It's risky, but um, I think it's uh, it's been it's been fine so far. Yeah. So I think maybe it is one of those like finding the common humanity in spite of all the differences, and they can find ways yeah. of making connections no matter where they're coming from. Exactly, and especially the way we set it up. You know, it's about um people's stories that you don't know of, so you don't know the background of these of these people, and therefore how you come at it is a really important thing and and most every student has been highly sensitive to it not we've never had a, a problem with the student and we've had elders in in the coffee mornings who just didn't want to engage you know they just wouldn't they just didn't want to really talk to anybody but that was fine and we didn't force never would force anything thank you okay ria let me just make sure yeah you do you want to say something no? Um, okay, I'm going to mute you. Other people, um, raise your hand, which is part of the participant option, I think, or type in on the chat. I, I've tried I, to uh, unmute people, but sometimes uh, they, re they revert again. Do you, do you want to say something, Tessa? Yeah, just I would like to ask about, you know, what, what's happening there, what happens at this kind of project there in your institution but also in in creative writing if there's space to do something like this because one of the things that i'm really interested in is partners um in order to in, in create in a creative writing department to um make a uh you know a big collaboration somehow you know it would be nice to share this project around a little bit and to make it an international exchange in some way so i just want to know if anybody is <clears throat> doing any of this kind of work in, in terms of life writing or a narrative exchange 
And I should say that um, the, there's a community university engagement grant. It's $15,000 offered by the community engagement office here at UBC. And I'm meeting with them. They, they reached out to me a couple of days ago. So I'm meeting with them next week about ways that the hub might involve itself in some community engagement projects. And the neat thing about that grant is the money goes directly to the partner. So if you can think of a community organization that needs that money, would benefit from that money, and you can develop this project in collaboration with them, it might be a really great opportunity. Um, who would like to talk? I am watching. Some people are unmuted, but I feel like others are still muted. Sarah, did you want to answer the question about um, well, I, creative yeah, writing, you know? Sure. Um, Tessa, there's myself and Taylor Brown Evans and um, Rhea Trigobov from the creative writing program. Um, to my knowledge, we haven't really done um, this kind of thing. I think Rhea could correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I definitely like we're, I mean, we're here because we're curious to hear more about it. Um, yeah, and, and Taylor and I teach comics classes. And so we're curious about what some of the, um, some of the possibilities might be. Like we don't have, you know, a fully formed project or anything, but we're, we're curious about it. Um, yeah. And uh, I think there's a project that, um, uh, it's, I'm just trying to remember the specific name, but if you kind of Google uh, Kings, maybe Kings County Clinic in Seattle, I think, it, anyway, it's this project that they do annually at the clinic where uh, local cartoonists go and um, meet with patients and just volunteer to tell the story. The, I think it's like a day or a few days that they do annually where they offer some free medical services. And so, cartoonists come down at that time and they will ask people if they're interested in um, having their stories told. And if people say yes, then the cartoonists develop like one page comics about um, mm -hmm. those people's experiences. And it kind of raises awareness about um, the availability of, of healthcare. Um, I, will, I will look online right now and find the link and post it in the chat. But yeah, so I don't know if, if others want to add something like that, but I think it's definitely something that could be really great for our students, for sure. Yeah, that that especially given that you know um, that's a particular skill that you know that they can offer. Language is one thing that we can offer in language and creativity, but that the, you know the uh, the added um, illustrative mm -hmm. level would be really great. And I was mentioning to you before uh, this meeting began that there's a project that involves some people at UBC in education, but also um, the PI is at UVic, called Narrative Art and Visual Storytelling, Graphic Narratives about the Holocaust. So that's uh, achieved some good support from um, Shirk, and it's working with a kind of life writing and illustration model. So that might be something we could look at, Sarah, because, uh, and I think one of the people involved in it is actually a creative writing grad. Yes, UBC, Miriam Levine. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So let's put that in the, uh, uh, let's see. Um, Emil, I'm not sure, health products and social services. Okay, I think that might not be a, a question. Um, comics in Transit mm. is an example of a similar project that happened here. Thank you, Erin. Um, other questions or comments? Tessa, you wanna say something? Well, I was just gonna say that, you know, I think I had never considered that creative writing students would wanna do anything but sit bit behind their desk and just write and I and and you know it was really a challenge for me to get them to think that they would you know want to be part of this with old people you know <laughs> and um and I was just so surprised and so and and it was and it was driven by the fact that our university really just you know decided they needed to be more engaged in the in the community and so it was driven from kind of top 
down, but then it really has become this kind of thing where the students want to keep doing it. So, um, and I think about myself meeting those people and seeing the exchanges, and I just want to keep being in the room with them. It's, there's just a lovely, lovely, lovely feeling. So, um, I, I just say that as in terms of encouraging your creative writing department to think more about that kind of community work. I think Ria wanted to say something more. Well, I just wanted to mention a project that I've only been peripherally involved in. It's called the Shoe Project, uh, Connecting Women, and it's uh, working professional writers, working with um, women who are either immigrants or refugees, and telling their, telling mostly telling their uh, transition story. Um, and I'll, right. I'll, I'll try to connect yeah. you up with that. Have you heard of that? No. That particular one, but um, we have a few here in, in London with refugees as well. We had one, one of my students was in, um, in Calais before they dismantled the, um, the camp, basically, um, the refugee camp, and did a storytelling project that was about getting them, they, they kind of wrote their, told their own stories, but were written by someone else. So they would get translators and stuff. So the, the refugee, um, storytelling is really important and, and interesting. Thanks, Ria. I think the model is is kind of unlimited, really, depending exactly. on what kind of community you want to engage for whatever reason exactly. in whatever yeah. course. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, well, I don't know um, in terms of your specific university, but I mean, I think, I, I think I don't think there's a university in the world anymore that that wants to remain, um, a, you know, an ivory tower. They think that the, all the, the, the all the gate engagement is outward, and into the community, and so um, I think it's an important. I'm not, I don't know how to answer your question, sorry, but I think, but I think that it's important for students to recognize it as world experience, work experience, employability, or, or write, you know, a writer's world kind of experience. For, for my students, it's about, it was kind of about promising them publication, which really worked. Um, but it was also about um, having them feel like they were, had an author had authority in, in um, the community, that they could teach and exchange, have an exchange about writing, that they had some sense of um, expertise about. And so it was giving them a lot of, of their own um, as confidence about as writers. So I think that that's something to be encouraged. There's a question from Layla. Do you want to ask it, Layla? Uh, sure, hang on. Hi. Thank you, Tessa. That was very interesting. I'm really enjoying this whole conversation. I think I'm coming back to that whole idea of consent and voice, and I'm particularly thinking of, um, say, disabled folk or people for whom consent has been denied um, and for whom it might be a much more complex process that takes longer to build trust and, um, and how you might build a project like this or include um, groups like this in a project such as this and I think it's so important because there's often these people are, whose voices have been silenced in many ways um, absolutely socially and culturally yeah. yeah absolutely I do think it is about consent and unless you have um, a group that that is fully there in order to share their stories then th there's just no way and and uh, we have in at UEA we have a burgeoning medical humanities project to the point we're going to ha be having a medical humanities MA and I'm part of the medical humanities group because it's, inter it's interesting there was a, there's a nurse named Christy Watts Christy Watson who wrote a book called the um Oh gosh, you know, I'm going to mess it up. Something of kindness. Um, anyway, it's a it's a book about n the nursing um, life, and and she invited me to a panel about um, about medical humanities, and and I just said, well, you know, why me? I just tell stories, and this is what I do with this with this project with City Life. And she said, that's medicine, and I said, oh, okay, okay, <laughs> because I think that's we have to look at medicine and those kinds of things around people 
in those communities as much more fluid and I don't but you know but I don't feel qualified to make those decisions so I think it's about joining up with other people so she this 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 woman um, another woman in our university is um, a woman with a, with a disability who's running a medical humanities um, storytelling group for a creative writing group for disabled um, uh, participants and so she's kind of the expert there and I'm going to sort of join in with there. It wouldn't be a place I would go alone without a kind of support from, from someone who has way more kind of expertise and sensitivity. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And also it seems sort of, it's like um, bringing together these, the storytelling project with other disciplines then at the institution as well. So bringing together. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, so we're going to be doing a lot of um, collaboration in the new um, BA that I've developed that's starting in 21. Um, we're, going to, going to, it, we're going to do collaboration with med students, um, with creative writing students, med students, creative writing students and, and um, an art college and um, media and, you know, some of the traditional collaborations, but um, medicine and law is something that we're going to, to, to try. It's hard when, you know, with those disciplines because they're so sort of stuck in their, in their, their timetables. <laughs> and so it's, it's very difficult to actually um, coordinate something officially with other schools or other departments, but medicine is definitely something that's happening at UEA. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. I think your description of, of um, the, the early days of the project w was really interesting because it wasn't attached to a particular course. So in one way, I think um, it's easier to build decent relationships of consent because you don't actually have to accept all your volunteers if, if no. you fear that something will not work well. Whereas in the classroom, if this is going to be an assignment, then yeah. it, the challenge is, is there to bring yeah. everybody up to speed on the questions of ethics and exactly. cultural sensitivity. So, so maybe the fact that you started with volunteers probably meant that you had time to learn the Absolutely. process. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. I, I posted the link to that language book. Of it's language of kindness. Yeah, we're on it. We're on it. <laughs> Gosh. Um, thank you. Yeah, don't don't mention, don't cite anything because <laughs> yeah, it's really. gonna get in the chat the second you mention it. Great. <laughs> uh, Lucia. I will try to unmute you. Um, how's that? No, just hold on a second. Okay, yeah. I think I'm unmuted now. Okay, great. Um, yeah, that's the, a question that I was just that you just brought up, Mary, about being in a classroom. And Tessa, I'm really curious about what happens when this kind of work is kind of under those evaluative metrics of you know being part of a program yeah. or part of a. So how does how does evaluation come into the picture yeah a lot of it is going to be well they're, they're going to be writing their own stories and they're going to be writing biographies but the, the evaluative part is the self-reflection so mostly you know so they're going to be keeping journals and and they're going to be doing um uh self-reflective essays about process about you know ethics about all of those things so that's also a, a, an important part of it you know not just the product when it's in the classroom and it, we i don't even know whether how, how we'll do that. I'm not sure it's a year away. So two years away because it's a second year module. So I'm, I, I don't have to deal with it quite yet, but um, it's going to be different for sure from what you've both said, you know, that, that it, it becomes something different when everybody has to conform to the um, expectations of the module so they have to get a mark out of it. And we do this in the first year we do um, they, they they collaborate with they have a project that they collaborate with on um, with art students illustrative students from a different college and we don't mark them on the work we mark them on the reflective essay great thank you because Gail. because yeah. they, they can't be it was you know they're not artists they're just they're just having the experience of collaboration yeah any other questions 
I'm watching the chat and I'm watching the hand raising and I'm watching your faces, <laughs> all, all the different cues that Zoom provides <laughs> us with for people who want to engage. I think that may be all for now, Tessa. Um, thank you so much uh, for your presentation and for your answers to questions. Uh, I just wanted to say to people in the room that if you'd like to pursue this further, uh, the Hub is happy to set up meetings and if we ever meet in person again to provide some catering, uh, to pair you up with a faculty member who has experience applying for the Q's grant or SHRC or connections or whatever. Uh, we can put you in touch with community partners that the Community Engagement Office has worked with already. And we also have funding twice a year for course releases and research clusters for professors at UBC. So let us know if, if you're inspired by this, whether you're inside or outside UBC, and, and we can help you pursue it. Heather is going to be sending a feedback survey after this event. So that's a place where you can uh, let us know what you're thinking and if we can help. So I, I hope we'll be in touch more. And our plan is that Tessa, if the airspace ever opens up, will come to UBC and speak more directly. So maybe that will be in September, um, if not September at some point later. So we'll keep you posted about that. That would be great, I hope so. Okay, thank you everyone. We'll let you leave the meeting Thanks now. Thanks for coming. We'll be in touch. Okay, bye-bye.